And I call on Fiona Hislop to speak to and move the motion. Uh, Presiding officer, I move the motion in my name. I am pleased to have the opportunity to turn Parliament's attention to Scotland's population needs and migration policy. Our discussion paper of that title sets out in stark relief how crucial it is that Scotland has the powers it needs to deliver a migration system tailored to the challenges that we face, challenges that are very different from the rest of the UK. And looking at the two amendments, I think we can have a constructive debate this afternoon. I think there is common ground. Like the Liberal Democrats, we think there are parts of the overall UK system which have to change, and we set that out in our paper. Like the Conservatives, we understand that any variable migration scheme would need to be developed uh, in partnership with the UK Government. And we acknowledge the concerns about variation, but also the support we have from business groups uh, for tailor-made variation. A growing population, and especially growth in the number of people who are of working age, is vital for a growing economy. Population growth has been the most significant driver of economic growth in both Scotland and the UK in recent years, ahead of productivity and labour market participation. And this has been sustained by people choosing to come here from other countries to live and work. And the evidence is overwhelming, but it is not new. Indeed, I recall Kenneth Gibson, MSP, championing the needs to address Scotland's population challenges back in the very first term of this Parliament. The National Records of Scotland and the Office of National Statistics Joint Projections tell us that for each of the next 25 years, there will be more deaths than births in Scotland. Over a third of Scotland's local authorities face depopulation over the 25-year projection. And the age profile of the population will also change. The proportion of the population of state pension age will increase by 25% as the baby boomer generation reaches retirement. People aged 75 and over will be the fastest growing age group, increasing by 79% in 25 years. And while ageing populations present a challenge across the UK, Scotland's situation is particularly acute, given that our working age population will grow only marginally compared to the rest of the UK, and the number of children being born in Scotland will decline. And unlike the rest of the UK, all of the projected increase in Scotland's population over the next 10 years is due to net uh, in migration. And let me be very clear, the fact that people are living longer, healthier lives is an achievement to be applauded. However, as our population ages and the proportion of those in work decreases, it is incumbent upon us as a government and as a just society to ensure that we are able to maintain public services for those in their later years who have paid into that system all their working lives. And these are long-term enduring demographic, uh, demographic issues that all developed uh, countries will have to address eventually, and Scotland needs to address them now. Children and families are essential to this, and we have a, a comprehensive package of support for families. We're making sure that children born today have every opportunity to lead productive lives. The importance of quality early learning and, child, early learning and child care cannot be under, uh, overestimated. We're expanding um, the child care offer. We've got the Best Start uh, grant. We're also developing skills in the workforce and promoting innovation. And just as population is a key driver for growth, so is productivity, and we have closed the productivity gap with the rest of the UK. But these and other significant efforts in skills and innovation, however groundbreaking, do not fully address the impact of an ageing society. And the weight of evidence is clear and cannot be ignored. Migration is a crucial component in Scotland's current and long-term economic and demographic sustainability. And Scotland faces different challenges in relation to population and dem demography and rurality from the rest of the UK. The Scottish Parliament and Government must have devolved powers it needs to address those challenges and with the urgency they require. And we are not a lone voice here. A consensus has been growing for some time, with every major party now seeing the need for a differential approach to migration. Only last year, Ruth Davidson wrote that post-study work visas should be reintroduced, questioned the target to reduce net migration to the tens of thousands and whether that's correct, and said that including students in the net migration target was distortive, counterproductive, and sends entirely the wrong signals. Indeed. Willie Rennie. I, I understand and I support initiatives on the post-study work visa, but does she not recognise that that scheme and other small schemes like that will not tackle the demographic challenges that we face both north and south of the border. 
Cabinet well, Secretary. I'm, I'm not sure whether uh, Willie Rennie's had a chance to, to read the document that we produced, but it's extensive evidence base, and it's exactly what we're saying, that we actually need to have um, the opportunities to decide ourselves right across Scotland uh, what we can do in terms of the choices that we can make. So I, I would encourage him to, to read the document. This consensus that we are building is growing. A recent report that the Westminster Home Affairs Committee uh, produced stated that the one-size-fits-all UK system is no longer appropriate and that a different approach is necessary. The Institute of Public Policy Research found that the UK immigration system doesn't cater for Scotland's unique needs. The Westminster All-Party Parliamentary Group on Social Integration said in a report last year that responsibility for immigration should be devolved. So, presiding officer, we're asking, like many others and for many other political parties in Scotland and the UK, that the arbitrary and damaging net migration target be abolished, and um, that the very least uh, migration to Scotland wouldn't be counted within it. Uh, the case for this could not be clearer, and Scotland depends on inward migration to grow its population but it is UK policy to reduce net migration across the whole of the UK and these two contradictory goals simply cannot coexist. And Scotland needs long-term settlement of working age people who raise families here. The net migration target forces the UK government to focus on short-term work visas solely to address skills shortages. And this does not work for Scotland. Indeed, the fact that Britain has, has hit its cap on skilled non-European workers for an unprecedented third month in a row with the salary requirement leaping from 30,000 to 50,000 uh, for February means the UK is already turning away health workers, software developer, uh, development workers and teachers. Uh, and that's even before the UK leaves the EU. And the situation of Sheena Halfpenny is another example of the current system just not meeting the needs of Scotland. She is the Canadian teacher willing to move from Nova Scotia to Mull to teach and to teach Gaelic in a primary school that has struggled to recruit for that post. But the Home Office told her and her sponsor, uh, Argyll and Butte Council, that her certificate of sponsorship was rejected as it didn't meet the required points for the Tier 2 visa. Presiding officer, the short-term nature of the UK visas doesn't address an ageing society. It's why we are also calling for the ability to make a, take a different approach to family migration so that we can improve the rights of people in Scotland to bring their close family with them. We need families, we need children. We want people to stay, to settle and to contribute. And we also want people who have moved away from Scotland to build their skills and experience, uh, but who now want to return to be able to do so. Yet the current rules on family migration uh, and that system means that many UK citizens are unable to bring their family with them if those family members were born outside the EU. And that cannot be right. And that was a point made by the UK Labour Party only yesterday in a speech by the Shadow Home Secretary, who described the net migration target as false and unworkable, with Tory migration policy leading to the breakup of families, going against fair and reasonable values, discouraging people choosing to live in this country at a time when we need them most. And we're calling for measures uh, which, which will tackle some of the barriers to business, such as the immigration skills charge, for that to be reviewed. And we're firmly of the view that businesses should not be penalised for simply employing the skilled staff they need. And so to Lib Dems, I would say that it's not an either-or of trying to influence UK-wide changes instead of pursuing tailor-made approaches to Scotland. It is both. Uh, and I hope the Lib Dems won't ignore the fact that Scotland needs that tailor-made uh, policy uh, as, as we're suggesting. And of course, it's telling presiding officer that Scottish ministers have no say in the only existing measure designed to address Scotland's specific needs, and that's the Scotland, uh, Scotland shortage occupation list. And it's vital that Scottish ministers have a say in what jobs are included on that list. And there's some speculation that UK might increasingly move to an even more sector-focused approach to migration, and narrow sectoral solutions won't work for Scotland. This is a whole economy, whole workforce, whole society issue, and I hope that UK will take a broader view. But I also want to touch on some of the issues um, of the post study work visa um, that have been beneficial, and it is to the credit of this Parliament and the previous Labour Lib Dem coalition that they address that specific need. Um, and it was indeed mainstreamed into UK immigration system before its withdrawal in 2012. 
The Smith Commission had, with, also, with all major party support, uh, also called on the UK government to reintroduce this visa. But you know, we have had no response and indeed uh, indifference. And so therefore, presiding officer, we need to make sure that we can try and develop an evidence-based argument that brings the consensus from Scotland together to make sure that we can persuade the United Kingdom government of, of the need for this change. The UK government uh, you know, cannot argue that uh, they can have a differentiated system in one part when we had the post-study work visa, but not do it now, particularly when employers are crying out for the flexibility uh, to make sure that they can uh, tackle some of the challenges that they have in the economy and recruitment. So the immigration system as it exists right now is already over complicated. We want to, I think, argue the case for reducing complexity, have a simpler rules. Uh, it's also why I think in terms of what we can do, we need to make sure, for example, within, uh, we use examples that exist already within the common travel area. The UK and Ireland operate their own migration systems with separate visas, but this doesn't compromise the principle of free movement within the common travel area. Uh, we're suggesting that uh, this, uh, there is a new route uh, that allows people to live and work here in the condition that they remain in Scotland. It wouldn't cut off or replace any other routes within the UK-wide system for people or employers. We now have separate tax codes for Scottish income taxpayers. I'm, I'm, I'm in my last moments. I've, I've been cut in terms of my speech time as well. Um, it's not, uh, you know, it's possible that we can have a differentiated system and we have the tools in which we can use if we so choose. So let's try and make sure that we can work together uh, to try and deliver that. It is of, of concern that the government's, uh, UK government's white paper will not be published until autumn. Uh, what we have done is set out a credible, well-reasoned, evidence-based case in our discussion paper. And we will continue to engage with businesses, trade unions, the universities and other bodies with an interest in attracting international to Scotland uh, to talent to Scotland and we will build on the significant knowledge and experience in this area to shape that policy for Scotland and we believe that people who have chosen to call Scotland their home are vital to us not just because of their very significant contribution to our economic growth but because they have enriched our lives and our communities because Scotland is and wishes to remain an inclusive progressive and outward looking nation and I invite everyone in this chamber to, to look at the distinctive needs that we have in Scotland we need a tailor-made immigration system for Scotland that recognise our needs. There are examples around the world of nations who have adopted such a differential system and there are no practical reasons why such a system would not work for Scotland. President officer, this is about political will and that will is most likely to succeed if we can have a united approach when we come to decision time. I move the motion. Thank you. I now call on Jackson Carlaw to speak to and move Amendment 10571.3, Mr Jackson. Oh. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Beautifully crafted speeches are being truncated this afternoon, so if it seems a bit lumpy, that, that is obviously why. Your may speeches I... are always beautiful, <laughs> no matter how truncated they are. May I begin by you. proposing the amendment in my name? You know, almost 60 years ago, I was born in my Eastwood constituency. Eastwood, where I've lived the vast majority of the years since, is a community which has proved to be home for many who have migrated to Scotland from the rest of the UK, the rest of the world, and from Europe. And let me tackle directly some of the myths often repeated to me as an MSP. Myths founded in concerns that migration is responsible alone for the pressures on our infrastructure and public services. It's simply not true. Yes, we have a housing shortage, but this is not because of migration. We've seen radical shifts in the way we choose to live, with far more single home occupancy and with longer life expectancy. Homes that might have been expected to appear in the open market two decades ago are now still happily occupied. Yes, we have busy hospitals and GP surgeries, but not because of migration. We have a population living longer, but not always well. Even in the lifetime of this parliament, we have seen new issues not envisaged when we first met, such as dementia and diabetes arising from obesity, present enormous strategic and budgetary challenges to the NHS. Yes, we have busy schools and colleges and universities, but not because of migration. Far more of our young people stay longer at school and proceed into further education of whatever kind. The suggestion that migration is at the heart of the stresses in our public life and services is a fantasy and a malicious and self-deceiving one at that. Let me be absolutely clear, both personally and on behalf of Scottish Conservatives. Migration, immigration and from wherever is good, necessary and desirable thing. There is a strong, powerful, unarguable case for migration to Scotland, and we are on its side. Presiding officer, let me turn now to the Scottish Government's... Dis yes. Willie Rennie. Ha has he made that case to his cabinet in the UK, and do they agree with him? 
Jackson Carlow. Can I allow myself to develop the argument, Mr Rennie? But yes, this is an argument that I make vociferously on behalf of the Scottish Conservative Party whenever I get the chance. Um, Presiding officer, let me now turn to the Scottish Government's discussion paper, Scotland's Population Needs. There is much in the analysis of the changing demographics of Scotland laid starkly for all to see in this paper with which we wholeheartedly agree. As, you know, Scotland's demographic over little more than a century has changed extraordinarily. While a hundred years ago it would be unusual to see a pensioner, let alone an octogenarian on our streets, over the next 25 years, those aged 75 and over will increase by 79%. It was described to me most vividly as being a demographic population pyramid, which will be inverted in the next 25 years. And that's the least of it. As Scotland leaves the Industrial Revolution and becomes embedded in the early years of the successor Technological Revolution, all manner of change lies ahead. Again, vividly described to me by characterising the change over the next 30 years as being every bit as complete and profound as all the change the world has seen since the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. A constant through will be our need to have as entrepreneurial an economy as possible with an engaged and productive workforce capable of sustaining our public services both financially and with people. And bluntly, our natural population growth will not meet the task. We need to ask though, why is it that currently only 5.9% of the UK's EU citizens settle in Scotland when our population should equate to an 8.1% share? After all, we have taxpayer funded university tuition, we have taxpayer-funded, can I proceed, taxpayer-funded care for the elderly. We have taxpayer-funded universal prescriptions. It is surely not that we offer a less attractive standard of social provision, nor is it as a result of Brexit. It long predates Brexit, even if Brexit does undoubtedly compound the challenge. We have to face up to the fact, in the words of the SNP, we have to have a mature discussion on why do people leave Scotland? Why a smaller percentage choose to come to Scotland? And what over the next two or three decades do we need to do to change that? Where we do agree with others is in regard to the advantages of the post-study work visa, and I welcome the support of others, which led to underpin the agreement which has now allowed Glasgow and Edinburgh to be included in the pilot arrangements. And we and Michael Gove also accept the need for a seasonal workers scheme, embracing agriculture and hospitality, which my colleague Peter Chapman will speak to later. Remove, however, presiding officer, the SNP do invest heavily in proposals which either remove all the existing restrictions and then devolve migration to Hollywood, where they would apparently establish a unique system for Scotland. Now, this discussion paper does its best to make that case, but I don't believe that in this case it convinces. Removing all existing controls to create a carte blanche regimen is frankly reckless. And while the... Can I proceed? I really am short of time now. And while the demographic challenge may well be marginally more acute, it is, a, it is a challenge nonetheless for the whole UK. While the potential sectoral employment shortfall in capacity is undeniable, it is undeniable in those employment sectors across the UK too. And the public accept this. That's why Professor Sir John Curtis's report, just 15 months ago, what Scotland is making of Brexit, 63% of Scots said they do not believe Scotland should have an easier migration system than elsewhere in the UK. And some 59% of Scots believe EU migrants should have no greater or lesser a status than migrants from the rest of the world. Now, the Scottish Government has spent the last 18 months making the alternative argument, but has failed to convince Scotland. I, I, well, I've tried, but I mean... I'll give, you, I'll give you the time back, Mr. Yeah, we're not saying it's easier. We think it should be controlled. We're not saying it's taking away the whole system. And the question that Mr. F uh, Professor Curtis will have asked will have been about a whole replacement system. We're talking about a tailor-made system. I, I, to come directly Thank you, to Mr. that Carlo. point as well. Let me be clear, the UK must have a future migration system designed by the UK to meet the needs of the UK, and that system most certainly needs to ensure that as a nation, we have the population we require to meet the sectoral employment needs we face, to ensure that the demographic challenges are met, and also, and importantly, that we continue to allow migration to influence and enrich the shape and tone of our national life. Indeed, let me be generous again to the discussion paper and argue that the seven principles detailed on page 19 as being the characteristics of policy and systems on future migration are an equally sound basis for a policy across the UK as they are for Scotland. And if I had the time, I would detail them, but I do think they directly address some of the points the Cabinet Secretary made, which are challenges to the UK and which I also support. 
My final point of argument today concerns the willingness of Scotland and Scots to enforce any variable or unique system. The paper rather coyly suggests that while the Scottish Government would set the policy, it would leave it to the UK Home Office to enforce the policy. And I have to ask, because I think this is a question that others will, when has any SNP, MSP or MP, and I mean ever, supported a Home Office decision to remove anyone from Scotland? I cannot recall such an occasion. And unless a policy such as the, demographic, the, the, the bespoke dif, uh, differentiated policy for Scotland is envisaged, has an enforcement action underpinning it, it is simply not practical and I do not believe it could be implemented. Presiding officer, I see I am now out of time, but against a background of unprecedented change, the emergence of a world of wholly different styles and patterns of work, of social engagement and integration, of transport and communications we cannot yet foresee, but which most of us here will live to see, against all this we need to recognise just how much Scotland will have to change and how much harder we will have to work to make Scotland the destination of choice for entrepreneurs, for skilled workers, for talent in all its representation, and even in an age of increasingly populated by drones, acknowledge and accept that our social and public services will continue to need ever more dedicated individuals to sustain them. That's why my amendment encourages us all to seek, to identify and to agree upon here in Scotland and across the UK Isles, and it's this ambition behind which we'll put our support tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call on Willie Rennie to speak and move Amendment 10571.2. Mr Rennie. Uh, thank you, Deputy uh, Presiding Officer. Um, I think we all agree in this chamber, by the sounds of it, that immigration enriches our lives. It is disappointing, though, however, that the Conservative Party as a whole do not support that position. And, you know, um, Jackson Carlow is a minority view in this. I'm glad he's making the case. But he really needs to make that case to people like Boris Johnson, who made the case during the referendum that 80,000 Turks were going to come over the border and flood the United Kingdom. Of Nigel Farage, who stood up on that Brexit poster, that breaking point poster, saying that all these immigrants were going to come into this country. Those are the people that he needs to make the case to. Those are the people he needs to persuade that they are wrong. And so far, he's not succeeding. Because the Conservative Party, are, he, has, he is a minority voice in the Conservative Party. The, we have, we're facing twin challenges in, on immigration. One is on the demographics, which we've heard quite a lot about. The 10,000 more deaths and births by 2041. And we've also facing the challenge on the economy, where we've got a short, shortage of workers in key sectors. But on the demographics, we need to accept that immigrants are not a burden, they're an asset to the country. They tend to be healthier, they tend not to have, many have not to have families here, and often many of them go back home once they've done their job. So they're not a burden to our society. In fact, the government figures through the government paper showed that the revenue to the government on an annual basis is around about £10,500 and they contribute about £34,500 to GDP. And we need, therefore, to continue to have immigration in order to deal with that demographic challenge um, faced by 2041, where we will not have population growth, but a population decline. So they are boosting taxes and they're paying for the public services that we all rely on. And in terms of the economic challenges with the workers in the key sectors, we not only face problems with the NHS and social care, but in issues like the agricultural sector, where there are thousands, in fact, about 10,000 workers in the food and drink sector that have actually led to that sector growing to £14 billion within the last few years. And it's expected to double by 2030. Now, the exchange rate already, as a result of Brexit, is driving some of those people away. So we're already struggling to get the workers that we need in order for that sector to thrive. It will not grow if we cannot get the workers in this country. And then on the university sector, where in my patch, 20% of the staff at St Andrews University are from the European Union and about 10% of the students. They're already being repelled by the Brexit vote and the message that we sent out on the back of the Brexit vote, pioneered by many Conservatives. Yes. Cabinet Secretary. We're away, aware of today's figures that show that for the fact we're, for, we're now seeing a situation where non-EU migration is actually now larger than EU net migration and a lot of this, the, the, the kind of issues he's raised are already being realised in the current immigration figures that came out today. Well, there and, and, yes, and what's interesting about that is that Anton Moscatelli, when he made his comments last year in this regard, is he said that the vote on Brexit 
is not just repelling people from the European Union, but it's sending a message to the rest of the world that Britain is not a country that welcomes immigration. And it creates the uncertainty because of the lack of access, potentially, to the European research area. It's deterring people from it. And I know many examples of academics who are choosing not to come here because they don't see this as part of the European research area and they don't see it as a country that's welcoming foreigners. And that is the case which the Conservative government are pioneering with their hard Brexit. And the real problem with this is that during the referendum, people were promised that immigration would go down. People were promised there would be fewer foreigners in our country. That was the, the aim of Boris Johnson's claims, and that was the aim of Nigel Farage's poster, to get people on side on the back of immigration. Now we know the real cost, potentially, to the economy of cutting immigration, and Jackson Carlow agrees with this, but now we know the real price of that, then there's a real risk that we'll, we'll be facing a choice of meeting the aspirations of people who voted for Brexit and damaging our economy or the other way around. And that is what's really potentially dangerous about this. That's why we need a proper debate about it across the United Kingdom, because it is a UK-wide issue. I disagree with Fiona Hislop on this. I mean, across the UK, the farm sector needs about 80,000 agricultural workers, the pickers at seasonal times of the year. In Scotland, it's between 10 and 13,000. So the dependence on those people is quite significant, both north and south of the border. If you look at the NHS, large numbers of people are leaving the NHS, not just in Scotland, but across the United Kingdom because of the Brexit vote. They're going back home. And in terms of the dependency ratio, yes, it's growing faster in Scotland, not just now, it's growing faster in Scotland than the rest of the UK, but the end point of the dependency ratio that's predicted is still at 67. So in Scotland, it goes up from 58 to 67. In the UK, it goes up from 61 to 67. So the problems are very similar north and south of the border, and it depresses me that every time we face a problem in this chamber, the SNP come forward with the answer that we need more powers for this parliament. We need to lead the debate across the United Kingdom to tackle the problem across the United Kingdom. Just by cutting ourselves off and looking after our own problems won't solve the wider issues across the United Kingdom. That's why I oppose the SNP's motion today. Let's lead the debate across the UK to make the change across the UK in order to get the immigration system that works for the whole of the UK. Thank you, Mr Rennie. Could you move your amendment, please? I move the amendment in mind. Thank you. I call Claire Baker to open for Labour. Ms Baker, please. Um, thank you, officer. I welcome today's debate. Uh, migration always has the potential to be open to misinformation and exploitation. We must deal with the facts of migration, talk about its importance to Scotland, face the reality of population decline and the impact this would have on our economy, our public services, our society. Although there are amendments before us, both the Liberals and the Conservatives seem to recognise the significance of the problem we face. It would be a positive move if the Parliament could reach a consensus on the need for a more honest debate about migration and a mature approach towards how we resolve it. And that includes working with the UK Government and finding solutions which do maintain the cohesion of the UK. There may be, sorry, there may be suspicions over others' motives, but there is a degree of common ground in the Parliament, and I believe the motion before us does give us an opportunity to reflect that. I don't agree with every conclusion of the government's document, but I do agree that if we do nothing, we are going to experience significant challenges in maintaining, never mind growing, our population. At the end of last year, IPPR published a migration strategy for the UK. It was a helpful contribution to the debate, and it highlights that immigration policy has too often been driven by political ideology, playing to prejudices and easy assumptions. The IPPR set out options for addressing geographical imbalances, but crucially it argues that the Home Office would retain responsibility for issuing visas and non-labour migration would remain under the purview of central government. This is the nub of the debate if we are to reach agreement. How do we maintain a UK-wide system which provides the necessary flexibility for the UK nations and regions? The reality in Scotland is that we need people. Population decline would have a serious impact on our economy, our society, our public services, and we need people to settle in Scotland to boost our population. 20 years ago, Scotland was facing real difficulties, and without positive migration, Scotland's population would be in decline. People aged 75 and over are projected to be the fastest growing age group in Scotland, presenting huge challenges for our working age population. 
For example, Audit Scotland last year published a report into NHS workforce planning. It is an increasingly ageing workforce with 38% of NHS staff aged over 50 compared to 34% in 2012. This is common across many sectors. But we have had recent population growth purely attributed to positive migration. Whatever migration system we decide on, we must continue efforts to attract people to come here. We will be competing in an international market for skilled labour and we need to make sure Scotland is attractive, welcoming and rewarding. I understand the cautions some express around a differentiated system. Any additional powers must be justified and there must be a demonstrated need for any change to the migration powers of this Parliament. We could make progress on how the occupational shortage list operates, our representation on the Migration Advisory Committee, tailoring current visa arrangements to support our economy. But crucially, any changes must maintain the cohesion of a UK migration system. They must maintain free movement within the UK and be compatible with the UK system. This cannot be about disrupting the UK migration system. This may sound challenging to achieve, but I believe there is much we can do to tailor and make the current system more responsible to Scotland's needs without additional powers. Although I do accept there is an argument for looking at some more flexibility. The Fresh Talent Initiative demonstrates how this could be done. But the frustration of a cross-party group of MSPs that we felt had been unable to advance this under the coalition UK government, who didn't fully engage with the issues, or they would have understood that our proposals wouldn't have impacted negatively on the UK system, shows that we do need to consider greater flexibility in the system to respond to the pressures we face in skill shortages and population decline. An evidence-based, robust case that is reasonable and stresses the Parliament's ongoing commitment to a UK-wide system could lead us all to an agreement. But our greater challenge is how we navigate a future UK-wide system of migration post-Brexit. We are still waiting for a UK immigration bill which looks to restrict migration further and is likely to focus on EU migrants. If the UK leaves the EU without a single market agreement, freedom of movement will come to an end. This is a very different landscape from the one we are currently operating in. And I do have concerns that if we move to an exclusively sectoral approach, or one that is overly restrictive, it doesn't recognise the benefits of people coming here to work, but then settling here, raising a family, being part of a community, important parts of addressing Scotland's demographic challenges. So we do need to be alert to future challenges and recognise the need for flexibility. Although so much is currently unknown, it is important that the Parliament is prepared to deal with this serious challenge. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, open debate, speeches of five minutes. Marie Goujon, followed by Jamie Green. Ms Goujon, please. Thank you, presiding officer. But I'd just like to start by picking up on some of the other comments because I felt like Willie Rennie's contribution was, was kind of going well in, towards minutes. the end uh, until we got to the end because if this isn't leading the debate on immigration, then what is it? But there's only so much you can do when you've started the conversation and you don't get anything back from the other side. And I just find that really frustrating because Scotland needs inward migration. It's just as simple as that. Um, because we know from the recently published Scotland's Place in Europe, People, Jobs and Investment, we know about the demographic challenges that Scotland faces and the predictions that we'll see more deaths than births every year for the next year, uh, for the next 25 years. We we'll have an ageing population and without migration, we're going to struggle to grow our own working age population. Uh, and we need an immigration system that focuses uh, that looks at all the constituent parts of the UK rather than looking at the UK as a whole because we can see the increasing pressure on key sectors in Scotland uh, and what and the impact of a bad immigration policy will do. It will impact our agriculture, public services and our wider economy and it's expected to cost us over £10 billion by 2040. But that's where I would also like to highlight, I mean I really wish that Ross Greer's amendment had been taken today and had been allowed because I think this is also a, a really valuable point that he tried to make about migration providing significant social, educational, cultural enrichment to society because I think all too often we think about the facts and figures without looking at the wider picture of what that represents. So what do we need? In Scotland, we need a differentiated system which recognises our distinct needs. The effects of Brexit and the restrictions of free movement are already being felt in spite of the fact that we haven't even left the EU yet. We're seeing this in key sectors, sectors of our economy, such as agriculture, which I know other colleagues will talk about today, and in other areas where Scotland takes the lead. So in Dundee, for example, is one of Europe's leading digital economies. Chris van der Kuhl, the head of 4J Studios, which is a video games company, which have helped develop that very status, 
illustrated the issues that they're facing just now. He said, it's happening already. When we talk to people about the impact of Brexit, they're already getting nervous about coming here. It really is starting to impact some companies' ability to hire, which is important because in a global business, it's all about attracting the best talent. It's short-sighted not to address this issue in a way that has been shown to be achievable in other countries. Dr Eve Hepburn, in her report to the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee on options for differentiating the UK's immigration system, explored some of the systems that are already in operation elsewhere. In Canada, two systems exist. They have the Canada-Quebec Accord, which sees responsibility for immigration in the hands of the Quebec government. It can decide the total volume of migrants, the selection of potential candidates, and the management of sponsorship arrangements. Quebec's situation is very like that of Scotland, as it historically had a declining population with low fertility rates and outward migration. And it's a system which has been proven to work there. Quebec has seen an increase in its population by 200,000 between 2011 and 2016, from 7.9 million to 8.1 million, and that's all been resulting from immigration. Spain has two systems in place for Catalonia and the Basque Country. Catalonia, after being granted a statute of autonomy to delineate powers of immigration, it authorises its own working visas for migrants employed there, with the Spanish government making the final decision on permits. The second, and as I said, the second system covers the Basque Country. Australia has a number of regional migration schemes which are broken down into subclasses that include regional sponsored migration schemes, the skilled nominated visa, the skilled regional state territory sponsored business owner visa and the working holiday visa. And in Switzerland, individual cantons have separate policies, for example, Vaux, an example of a canton which, like Scotland, welcomes migration and the benefits that it brings to the economy and to the region as a whole. Differentiated systems are proving to work in other countries and they can work here. We've had a taste of that in Scotland already with the Fresh Talent Scheme. This was a successful post-study work scheme which ran for three years uh, when it was mainstreamed into the UK immigration system and then dropped by the UK government in 2012. University Scotland estimated that the ending of that policy costed Scotland 254 million up to 2015 and lost us 5,400 students and claimed that the UK now has one of the least competitive policies on post-study work in the English-speaking world. While the Smith Commission recommended that this be reviewed, the only thing standing in the way of that is the UK government and the political will to make it happen. The only current means within existing legislation where there is any consideration of the needs of Scotland is the Scotland shortage occupation list. So while the Scottish government can contribute to that list, they're essentially no more than consultees given they have no formal role in the determination of what those occupations considered to be in shortage actually are. Now right now we're at a critical stage in discussing this while the immigration bill is being drafted. Scotland is more dependent on migrants for growth than other parts of the UK, but the UK policy is to reduce net migration. And, and you must, no, you must conclude, I'm sorry, you really must conclude, time is absolutely tight. I'm going to, presiding officer, and simply to say we need any new system to recognise our needs in Scotland, and more importantly, we need mm. the political will on both sides of that to and make it happen. And that's it. Thank you very much. I have to be, I'm sorry, I have to be quite hard on members because the statement took a lot of the time out. We've virtually no time in hand, so you've all been warned. Try to cut your speeches down to five minutes. I know you're all capable of it. Jamie Green, followed by Graham Day, please. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. I'll try and cut as I go, so apologies for the clunkiness of some of my comments. But I'd like to bring uh, some personal experiences to the debate today because this is about migration and immigration, and it is really about people and where they choose to live and work and travel to. Um, I come from a family which largely emigrated to Canada uh, starting in the 1950s. Uh, the first of them went over on a boat in search of a new and better life. Many of them never come back. In fact, our clan is as strong as ever over there. And I too was one of the many thousands who left Scotland as a young man and headed for pastures new. In my short 37 years, I've lived and worked in many places, towns, cities and countries. London, Bristol, Spain, Sydney, Ontario, and even Kings Lynn at one point. Uh, much of the rationale for differentiated immigration systems comes uh, from the previous speech where they cite the examples of Canada and Australia. So I'd like to think, having lived and worked in both those countries, I can bring some first-hand experience and actually put to bed some of the myths around how these systems work. When my visa ran out when I lived in Australia, I recall being given just three days' notice to leave by officials. I had to pack up my life, quit my job, empty my apartment, leave my friends uh, and a relationship and get on an airplane and come home never to return. 
I accept that packing up your things and moving country is a big deal to people. It's a huge risk, and people do it for a variety of reasons, economic, social, cultural, adventure, and sometimes just curiosity. That's certainly what drove me to move overseas and set up a new life. So the debate around the ability of a country being able to choose what skills it needs and what economy it wants to create is an important one. Now, I try to intervene on the Cabinet Secretary in open remarks. I appreciate time is tight, but from her opening remarks, I'm still entirely unclear if it is the SNP's view that there should be no cap on immigration at all or there should be no migration targets. And I do want to press that point because uh, I'd like the Cabinet Secretary to state that if that is the case, then surely a tailored system, and the whole point of a tailored system, is that it inherently comes with the ability to choose the type of skills that you want to enter your country by having control over these. Now, the debate is around the suggestion that within the UK there could be differentials in policy. And I think it's fair to have this debate, because whilst many are opposed to Brexit in principle, it does open up these types of discussions, and future immigration policy certainly is one of them. The Cabinet Secretary also opened by saying there is consensus uh, on the issue of a tailored system. But the definition of consensus is just as subjective as the subject that is debating. So I'd like to draw on some of the other comments that have been made by business and academia, who I value and trust. Now, the FSB expressed some concerns around the effects of such a differential scheme on businesses themselves, the cost of managing and operating such a scheme. Uh, the NFU, who represent our Scotland's farming communities, uh, also seem to prefer a UK-wide solution whilst taking into account the needs and asks of Scotland as well. The Food and Drink Federation, who I suspect many of its members largely re uh, rely on a, a large migrant workforce, were also worried about companies which work across the UK and how those visas may be implemented, uh, if it's brief. Minister. Thank the member for giving way. Without trading examples, uh, only this morning, uh, the member should be aware that I met with the SCDI uh, who urged me and indeed this parliament more widely to lobby for a differentiated solution. Uh, will he join me in doing so? Jamie Green. Well, I think the, the, the devil's really in the detail of what this differentiated solution would look like. It raises far more questions than answers at the moment in terms of how on earth we would enforce such a solution. If there was a Scottish work visa north of Berwick, how would that work in practice for people who enter the UK south of the border and vice versa if they only have a permit to work in Scotland. It does raise substantial questions we simply don't have time to go into in detail. We should have the debate, we should do the research, we should have the argument, but do it properly and not uh, just jump on uh, the bandwagons of asking for it for the sake of it. Now, I appreciate there is desire for change too. Um, you know, I come from a part of the world that was once the home of the electronics industry, IBM, National Semiconductors, uh, uh, anyone who knows uh, that part of the world will remember those businesses. But those sites now lie empty. Where do young Scots go when they want to fulfil their ambitions? Do they do what I did? Do they, I haven't really got no, time I'm afraid I do apologise. No, I'm members of this last bit. Do they up sticks and move south of the border or overseas? Or are we providing them enough highly skilled jobs as it is here? So let me say this in my final moments. Let's future-proof a Scottish workforce so that the jobs of tomorrow can be filled as industry changes. We don't need a new migration policy to do that. We can do that today at school with the right skills and the right teachers to teach those skills. Let's start with the basics. Let's protect our single market, the UK, and let's ensure that Scotland is an existing attractive place to come and work and live. Let's have the debate, but let's have it for the right reasons and with the right motives. Thank you. Thank you. I call Graham Day to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Mr Day, please. Thank you, President Officer. This does feel a wee bit like Groundhog Day, the best part of two years on from that fateful Brexit vote, and still we have no resolution of what migration post-leaving the EU will look like. And personally, I find myself rising yet again in this chamber to highlight the implications that has for a key economic contributor in my constituency, namely the soft fruit sector. And all the time since I first raised this matter back in late June 2016, Little has changed, a part of that is from the growing evidence of the negative impact Brexit and the accompanying uncertainties is having. Despite the lobbying from the sector and this government supporting its efforts to have Westminster recognise the needs that it has to access a seasonal migrant workforce, we are no further forward. Michael Gove may have promised Scots fruit farmers news on a way forward by the end of next month, but then he went in front of the English NFU, NFU rather, and admitted the decision was out with his control. 
Presiding officer, farms in my constituency are utterly dependent on people coming from other countries to pick the fruit they grow, many of whom come back year after year. But the anti-immigration rhetoric which characterised the Brexit debate, coupled with the value of the pound, has already led regular ret returnees either to opt for pastors new or draw up plans for a future away from Scotland. As noted in the Scottish Government's discussion paper, which was launched before recess, many businesses have expressed concerns about the impact already in Scotland, concerns rightly shared by this Government. And the evidence of the impacts goes beyond the anecdotal. As I laid out here in a previous debate back in November, the Angus Growers Cooperative, based largely in my constituency, needs 4,100 workers annually. Last year, 347 seasonal employees either did not arrive or left early. As a direct consequence, these farms took a combined £660,000 hit. And Angus Growers in the wider sector is bracing itself. The 2018 season is fast approaching. Next month is when the EU workforce returns. Last year set a trend. No one seriously expects to see it reversed. Let me share some bang up to date supporting evidence from the major farm in the Growers Collective. On this particular farm in 2016, 296 of their workforce out in the field were returnees from the previous year. In 2017, that number dropped to 267. The total confirmed for the coming year stands at 212, a drop of almost 19% in just 12 months. And that simply cannot be allowed to go unchecked, not for Angus, not for Scotland, nor indeed for the rest of the UK. A recent report on The Guardian revealed that a soft fruit farmer in Herefordshire was to move some of his company's raspberry and blueberry growing to China. That will lead to 200 seasonal jobs being lost. Citing the lack of clarity from the Prime Minister on the UK government's immigration policy, Angus Davison said, we are already out of time. Now, Mr Davison has written to Theresa May saying, and I quote, unless a seasonal worker scheme is put in place, we must expect to see the steep decline of the significant rural employer and source of food. Presiding officer, do we want to have to import food that can be readily grown on these islands from China owing to the UK government being unwilling to recognise the needs of an industry? Is that to be one of the achievements of Brexit? But of course, immig migration concerns aren't restricted to agriculture or indeed seasonal workers. The Scottish Government's analysis paper estimates that Scotland's GDP will decrease by 4.5 per cent by 2040 if migration levels are reduced to the UK government's target levels. This is equivalent to a fall of almost £5 billion pounds in GDP. Across the UK, the impact would be smaller, with a 3.7% reduction. If the UK government was to reduce net migration to the tens of thousands, as some have suggested, Scotland's fall in GDP would be 9.3%, compared to 7.6% for the rest of the UK. So I welcome the Scottish Government having developed proposals, a bespoke solution for Scotland to seek to address this. This is a sensible and necessary move, given the inertia at a UK level. There is an indisputable need to plan for the UK government failing to come up with a sensible UK-wide migration policy as increasingly looks likely. As MSPs, we need to come together and pursue what's in Scotland's best interest, because isn't that what we were, all of us, elected to do? Presiding officer. Thank you very much. I call Jackie Bailey to be followed by Julian Mark. Ms Bailey, please. Presiding officer, I'm grateful for the opportunity to discuss migration in the chamber and welcome the Scottish Government's analysis paper and approach. Um, I think I've told the chamber before, my mother emigrated from Glasgow to Hong Kong, um, where I was born, and I made the journey in reverse. So it could be said that I am a migrant to Scotland. Scots are, of course, to be found in every corner of the world, and we in turn welcome people to this country from across the world. But there's no doubt Brexit has huge implications for all of us. In some areas, we can only begin to estimate the impact on our economy and on individuals too. And whilst it is a huge time of uncertainty, we can be clear about the impact that Brexit will have on the labour market in Scotland. Some 181,000 EU nationals live in Scotland. Majority of them are Polish. They're followed um, in succession by the Irish and Spanish nationals. And I want to speak about specific sectors in a moment. But we know that Scotland's population is projected to decline if we do nothing. We are also unfortunately ageing. Indeed, we are um, a more rapidly ageing population than the population elsewhere in the UK. So we absolutely depend on inward migration to meet our population growth target. 
If that migration is absent and EU nationals are not able to come here, our population will inevitably decline, but with quite severe negative impacts that will be visited on our economy. It will lead to labour shortages in key industry sectors and in public services we hold dear. Now let me touch on some of the most affected sectors. We've heard already about the soft fruit industry. It relies on seasonal labour and the majority of its employees come from the EU. That industry has grown substantially in the past 20 years and it contributes over a billion to the UK economy. We simply cannot afford to lose it. This applies to farming more generally. And it's not only a concern for our fruit growers, but the other concern is how we deliver that fruit, so adding to our exports. In what is already a very constrained sector, where Scotland is short of 11,000 lorry drivers, the impact of losing foreign driving capacity that partly fills that gap will be severe. The hospitality sector would experience a double whammy in losing employees from the EU, who make up a significant element of the workforce, and also losing visitors from the EU to this country. That will have a material effect, not just on the industry, but on this country's GDP. If we consider universities alone, we see that EU nationals comprise 9% of students, almost 25% of research staff. We risk losing talented European staff and academics, and nobody can tell me that that would not be bad for the education sector and the economy. The impact on our NHS will also be immense. There's been a 96% drop in nurses who want to come to Scotland. Vacancy rates are up. One in five doctors are thinking about leaving. Brexit and the lack of response from the Tories on migration are contributing to driving doctors and many other essential professionals out of the country. Presiding officer, let me turn briefly to what we can do. We should have a differentiated immigration system that can be linked to specific centres. But I, I take um, Claire Baker's point that actually it needs to be flexible and wider. We've had, though, a differentiated system before with a fresh talent scheme introduced by Labour and Liberal Democrat coalition. And we can do so again. Now, I agree with the seven principles set out in the Scottish Government's paper. But frankly, we need to get on with it. We need to deliver practical action with a degree more urgency. Brexit is round the corner. And I very much welcome the tone and tenor of Jackson Carlaw's approach. But I would absolutely urge him to use the influence he has on the UK government to bring them to the table, to create a differentiated migration system that actually works for all of Scotland and to do it soon. Thank you. Thank you. I call Gillian Martin to be followed by Ross Greer. Ms Martin, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Last February, probably around this time, I gave a speech on the potential impact of Brexit on Scotland's economy. And as I was preparing for today's debate, I gave it a cursory look. And I could have recycled it. I could have delivered it again, word for word, without any fear of any of the asks and questions I had in that speech for the UK government contained within it being irrelevant or out of date. I rarely quote Theresa May, but the phrase, nothing has changed, seems particularly relevant here. We are still in the dark as to what will happen to our labour market as a result of Brexit and what plans there are to protect it. And I say that coming straight from the frankly odd experience of viewing the UK government's Brexit, Brexit papers that the Scottish office have finally delivered to this place for MSPs to view in a secure room. It would not be fair to say that I know any, any more now than I did before I went into the room, except it looks like the UK government officials, at least, are owning up to Brexit being an economic disaster. Uh, I say owning up, I can't prove it because uh, we can't reveal any detail and they've signed a pledge to say that we'll not divulge anything we just read. So the public still knows nothing of what's in the report, scant as it is. Back to immigration matters, Scotland has benefited enormously from migration, whether permanent or temporary, of other EU citizens, and I'm in no doubt that ending free, free movement will have a detrimental effect on our economy, society, individuals and families. And I represent a constituency that depends on that migration to sustain our agriculture, tourism, fishing, hospitality, health and care sectors. 
In particular, that we have been fortunate in the North East to have so many Polish, Lithuanian and Estonian people settling. And due to the fortunate position we find ourselves in as the energy capital of Europe, some other sectors have found it difficult to compete for workers. I'm always reminded Billy Conley tells the story of uh, the Glasgow schools opening their gates and everyone just leaving and going straight into the shipyards. He tells that story in one of his stand-up routines. Well, much the same way uh, that, that happens in the Aberdeenshire schools. They open their gates and everyone goes straight offshore or into oil service jobs. But that means that more traditional northeast sectors like farming and fish processing have often struggled to recruit. Um, and that was certainly the case in Mint Law, which saw its fish processing factory have to close its doors uh, a few decades ago due to the inability to re uh, recruit locally. But now, because so many Eastern European people have come to work and settle in the town, McDuff shellfish is thriving and exporting millions of pounds of shellfish all over the world. And a couple of weeks ago, myself and Ross Greer with the uh, Education Committee met with around 10 female students from other EU countries at the Peterhead campus of Nesco. Um, and there were women trained to be mechanics, accountants, nursery teachers, all settled in Peterhead for years and wanted to continue to contribute to Peterhead life. But many of us telling us that family and friends that were hoping to join them are changing their minds. In rural areas like mine, we're more reliant on European economic area workers than non-rural areas. Without migrant workers, the interim report by the National Council of Rural Advisors said that many businesses would be, quote, unviable. And the SRC report this week echoed that. And uh, my colleague, Graeme Day, has mentioned about the soft fruit sector. I have soft fruit in my area as well, around Old Meldrum. Um, I was particularly struck by the evidence given by Angus Soft Fruits in the Economy Committee last year. Um, they said, we could scale right back and match our production to the local labour, or we could simply move abroad. And here in Graeme Day's speech, which has got more up-to-date information from the soft fruit growers in Angus, it looks like our fears, their worst fears have already been realised, and Brexit hasn't even happened yet. Imagine no Scottish-grown summer strawberries and raspberries. And aside from the huge impact on the local economy, I can't say I'm excited about buying forced growing imported strawberries that taste like neeps. <laughs> The needs of Scotland are completely different to the UK as a whole, and it's time we had an immigration policy which reflect this. And after viewing the Brexit documents in the Queensbury House an hour ago, I'm clear on one other thing. We all know the team at the Scottish office has been increased in the last two years. And like many, I'm at a loss as to what on earth they'll find for their uh, civil servants to do, since we've already got a Scottish government. So here's an idea. Why don't they use their army or civil servants to carry out a regional, a true regional, Scottish regional breakdown of EU migration in Scotland so we can understand more fully the potential shortfall and get a fit for purpose, differentiated immigrating strategy in place that takes the specific needs of regions of Scotland into account. It's not just necessary, it's urgent. Thank you very much. I call Ross Greer to be followed by Claire Hockey. Mr Greer, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The paper by the Scottish Government is a welcome contribution to the debate on migration and population in Scotland. It recognises the economic contribution that migrants make to Scotland in, a partic in particular and how migration has shaped our country's history. The contribution of migrants to Scotland, though, cannot be reduced to just economics, as the unselected Green Amendment mentions and as the paper itself ably addresses. People who choose to come and live in this country contribute in so many ways, including uh, socially and culturally. Large numbers of migrants to Scotland from the EU and further afield work in areas as varied as the creative industries, agriculture and higher education. More than one in three of the staff at some national performing companies are EU citizens, EU27 citizens, and almost a quarter of university research staff. Without their contributions, would our university sector still be world leading? Would Edinburgh remain a global cultural centre? Migration also speaks, though, to the kind of society we want to be, to our collective identity and our values. We have thankfully not witnessed a political race to appear tougher on migration in Scotland, stamping controls on immigration on mugs or chiselling it into stones. The contrast between the political debate here and at Westminster is a stark one. But I would ask members speaking today who know that their own party colleagues in Parliament and in government at Westminster take a very different approach. What are you really doing to challenge that? Standing here and challenging it is one thing. Challenging it directly within your party and actually making change is another. At Westminster, we've seen a government deliberately set out to create a hostile environment, their own words, for migrants. They've created an inhumane system in pursuit of statistical goals that are ultimately detrimental to the country as a whole. It's policymaking at its absolute worst. 
Employers, public services and even landlords have been turned into the enforcement arm of the Home Office, obliged to run immigration status checks on people. This not only risks migrants being turned away from housing or employment due to concerns over remaining legally compliant, it also gives free rein to racists to justify discriminating against others, as we've seen evidence of already with housing in particular. Several months ago, I met with EU citizens here in Scotland at the Language Hub in Glasgow. They told me about the fear and anxiety that they, they'd experienced since the European referendum because they did not know what their future status would be. They've had to disclose their nationality to access the NHS. They've seen things like flat ads with no EU nationals on them. But they do not even face the worst of UK immigration policy. Just yesterday, a long-running investigation by BuzzFeed exposed insights into the human suffering and misery created by the Tories' hostile environment. They found that efforts to tackle modern slavery are being undermined by the government's aggressive obsession with deportation. They revealed a case where a victim of child sex trafficking, now in his 40s but trafficked into the UK as a child, had been finally granted official recognition as a victim of slavery, but was still slated for deportation. Only one in 10 recognized victims of slavery are granted leave to remain in the UK. It's incredible. And this is only the most recent revelation of the harsh reality of the UK government's immigration and asylum system. There are many more examples of families torn apart, child refugees deported as soon as they hit 18. It's imperative that Scotland is devolve powers over migration and asylum where possible, not just for the sake of our economy, though it is vital, but also to ensure that those making their lives here are treated with the most basic dignity and compassion that they be we believe they deserve. We need to stop the harm done to vulnerable people and the damage being done to our economy, our society and our culture. We need to ensure that the needs of Scotland are met. Argyll and Butte in my region is identified as one of the most fragile areas with an ageing and declining population. Between 2014 and 2049, its population is projected to decline by 8%. Scotland's migration strategy needs to encourage people to settle in these areas, to bring the benefits of migration to them, to ensure that many rural communities can continue to exist at all. We know that devolved approaches to migration work, as the motion highlights the Fresh Talent Scheme operated in Scotland with great success. At the time, though, this scheme worked in cooperation with a Home Office, which was much more open to progressive migration policies than the one we face now. But we know of examples from other countries. The European External Affairs Committee took evidence on devolved migration systems, highlighting the success of examples of extensive devolution in Australia, Canada in particular, as well as various other schemes across the world, such as in Switzerland that Marie Goujon mentioned. Action should be taken by the UK government on this now. Given the profound risk that the current government's Brexit plan poses to Scotland, action really must be taken now. Though there are actions that we can take here with the competencies we already have immediately. It's great to see the Scottish government consult on the electoral franchise, for example. The right to vote must be expanded to all those who live in Scotland, including all migrants, refugees and asylum seekers. Your right to vote should be based on residency, not nationality. And I look forward to making that case as the consultation moves on. We say it often, but really, it cannot be said enough. Scotland is a welcoming country. We're an outward-looking and internationalist country, but we need the powers to make that aspiration a reality. And it's time for the UK government to listen. I call Claire Hockey to be followed by Graeme Simpson. Thank you, presiding officer. Despite the best attempts of some populist parties and some sections of our press in trying to frame public opinion against immigration, it's heartening that we as politicians have united today to talk up the positives of immigration rather than build upon the anti-migrant rhetoric which seems to be ever more prevalent. The progressive narrative of today's debate is entirely understandable. There can be few of us in this chamber who are not descendants of migrants ourselves. Indeed, I can trace my own ancestry back to both Ireland and to Russia. Presiding Officer Scotland and the wider UK, for that matter, have benefited massively from immigration. Migrants uh, originating from within the EU and out with are making a vital contribution to our economy, to our culture, and they're ensuring that we have the workers to meet the needs of our businesses and our public sector. In my own constituency of Rutherglen, we're fortunate to have friends and neighbours from across the globe, from Poland, Bangladesh, the Philippines, Ireland, Germany and Italy, to name but a few. However, our EU migrant workforce is under severe threat with Brexit and the associated curtailment on freedom of movement. The economic impact of Brexit-driven reduction in migration is estimated to result in a decline in government revenue of 3.5% in Scotland, but by 2.7% in the rest of the UK. 
And from these figures, we can conclude that Brexit will disproportionately affect Scotland. Therefore, one could argue we require a different arrangement to protect our economy, which is so heavily reliant on inward migration. Presiding officer, at this point, I wish to refer members to my entry in the Register of Interest and in that I am a registered mental health nurse and currently hold an honorary contract with NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. And through my profession, I know firsthand how my colleagues in mental health and the workers in our hospitals and A&E services and those in our GP surgeries all play a vital role in supporting the health needs of our population. But sadly, the UK government's position, or lack thereof, on guaranteeing EU citizens' rights is already having a detrimental impact on flows of inward migration, especially on our NHS. No matter what Ruth Davidson may have said on television at the weekend, no deal has yet been struck on securing these rights. Figures collated by the Nursing and Midwifery Council show that the number of new nursing applications from the EU fell by 96% since the Brexit vote in 2016, from 1,304 in July 2016 to a mere 46 in April 2017. And this is before we begin to take into account the effect of ending freedom of movement when we leave the EU. The Tories are quick to argue that an exodus of EU health workers is yet to take place. However, I would remind them that neither has Brexit. We must maintain inward migration to Scotland, including the existing free movement with, the, with our EU neighbours, to help increase Scotland's population and to keep our NHS from reaching crisis point. As Janet Davis, the Chief Executive and General Secretary of the Royal College of Nursing said, if there is a Brexit cliff edge in migration, it will be the NHS going over it. Presiding officer, while immigration policy remains reserved, the Scottish Government will advocate for and attempt to influence change in the UK migration system to ensure Scotland's needs are met and as far as they can be within UK policy. For example, as we've heard, the Scottish Government will advocate the reintroduction of the post-study work visa, the scrapping of the arbitrary net migration target and the ending the scandal and heartbreak of Skype families by improving the rights of people in Scotland to bring close family members into the country with them. These changes at UK level would greatly benefit Scotland. However, there's an overwhelming case for the Scottish Government to be given the power to tailor its own immigration policy. The UK Government's one-size-fits-all approach to migration is no longer appropriate. Scotland is a different country with different needs, so it's time for a different approach. Expert after expert, study after study, committee after committee, we are consistently told of the benefits of Scotland having its own distinct immigration policy. From this Parliament's own Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee and the subsequent report by Dr Eve Hepburn to the UK Parliament's Scottish Affairs Committee, the evidence shows that reforming our immigration system would, be, would better reflect the diverse makeup of the different parts of the UK. Presiding officer, it's clear the need to address disparities between the UK-wide immigration system and the different labour and skills shortages in the constituent parts of the UK will become even more pressing after Brexit. If the Tory government won't accept our specific population needs, and if they do not make the necessary changes to address these needs, then they should think about giving these powers to the Scottish SNP government, who will. Graham Simpson, followed by Ben McPherson. Thank you. Scotland is a progressive, outward-looking nation. Migration strengthens our society and our nation benefits from the skills, the experience and the expertise of those individuals who have chosen to live, work and study in Scotland. Future migration systems should ensure that Scotland can welcome people uh, within Europe and from elsewhere who want to study, live, work and raise their families here. Presiding officer, these were the opening words of the Scottish Government's migration paper, and they're words that none of us would disagree with. Scotland needs immigration, but so does the rest of the UK. Movement of people enriches societies, and it enriches those who do it. Migration is good, but clearly cannot be a free-for-all. It can fill labour gaps. Jamie Halcrow Johnson will touch on this. But in my own subject area, housing, I hear all the time that there is a skills shortage, that builders are getting older and not enough young people are taking up their trades. Attracting people from abroad can help, but we should be training youngsters from here to be brickies, plumbers and electricians. We should be doing something to attract them to become architects, surveyors and planners. There is much in the Scottish Government document 
to agree with. The seven principles uh, in the paper, for example, that migration policy should address the needs of all Scotland, attract the best talent, protect workers' rights, enable families to be together, focus on what people can contribute, not what they can afford, and be controlled. The second and last points are particularly important. Scotland needs to be attractive. Just saying it's attractive isn't enough. We have to make it so. So whacking up taxes on middle earners does not do that, and we will see the results in years to come. The last point is also crucial. Migration should be controlled. The question is at what level of government? Now, the Scottish Government paper was written through the prism of Brexit and the yellow lens of nationalism with the intention of driving a wedge between Scotland and the rest of the UK. It was to be expected, but it's not sensible and mature government. Should Scotland have its own immigration policy? You might as well ask, should Newcastle have its own? Should Merseyside have its own? The West Midlands? Or why not break it down within Scotland and ask, should Glasgow, Aberdeen or Dundee have their own? It is difficult to see how applying different immigration rules to different parts of the UK would not complicate the immigration system, how it would not harm its integrity and cause difficulties for employers with a presence in more than one part of the UK. Anyway, Scotland's issues are not unique. As Dr Madeleine Sumption of the Migration Observatory at the University uh, of Oxford told the Scottish Affairs Select Committee last month, there are other areas of the UK that are experiencing population decline or would be experiencing population decline if it was not for migration. The Scottish Chambers of Commerce told the Scottish Parliament's Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee's inquiry uh, on immigration that devolution of immigration powers to Scotland is not necessary but that we should look at sectoral and geographical issues. We should be able to find solutions. The Law Society's briefing came up with a useful idea. They said Scottish representation on the Migration Advisory Committee would be beneficial. Active review of the Scottish shortage occupation list would also be welcome to ensure the list genuinely reflects skills shortages in Scotland and can be updated and amended as necessary to meet the needs of the Scottish economy. So we should look at that. Presiding officer, the SNP may think they speak for Scotland in everything, but they don't. They're out of tune with the country on this. The people don't want a different immigration system here. And as Jackson Carlo mentioned, polling by Natsen found that 63% of Scots did not believe it should be easier for EU migrants to come to Scotland compared to the rest of the UK while only 24% agreed it should. Presiding officer, we need migration. Migration is good. I back the amendment in Jackson Carlow's name. Ben McPherson, followed by Pauline McNeill. Thank you, presiding officer. As a passionate internationalist, I'm proud that Scotland has for centuries been an international nation. And today, international links are as important as they've ever been to high-tech industries, to manufacturing, to food and drink, to social care, and so many other sectors of our economy. It is vital for the Scotland of today, for the Scotland of tomorrow, and for the challenges we face together. But what's also vital is an openness to attract skilled labour and motivated individuals. And free movement of labour is absolutely paramount to this, to our present and to our future, to our economy and to our society. For centuries, Leith in particular has been one of Scotland's gateways to the world from Roman times to recent times. And that's why I hope one day to see a migration museum in Leith at the old customs house. Edinburgh, Northern and Leith has one of the highest migration levels in Scotland. From New Leather selling products 100 years ago to migrant programmers driving Edinburgh's fintech boom here in the 21st century. 
from hospitality to culture, from public services to commerce, Leith demonstrates a truth that prevails across Scotland, a truth that not only do we benefit from migration in Scotland, but we require migration to support our everyday lives and the standard of living that we've become accustomed to. For example, in the NHS, medical professionals from around the globe have played a vital role and are highly valued in terms of the labour that we require for our NHS and have been for decades. The creative industries, artists from around the world, choose Scotland to create their performances, their music, their installations and pieces of literature. And we all benefit from that. Over 12% of those employed in the food and drink sector, 10,000 people are EU nationals. 13% of those employed in the tourism center, uh, sector, 24,000 are EU nationals. And as has been touched on in the construction, in construction industry, attracting workers to come here from elsewhere is absolutely vital to tackle the housing shortages that we currently have. And that is why, to me, we need flexibility to set different policies here in Scotland. Because let's be clear, UK immigration policies for many years have failed Scotland by focusing, perhaps understandably, on the southeast of England. And Brexit is undoubtedly, in all the analysis, going to make this worse. There will be labour shortages. There will be negative economic impact. Because each EU citizen in Scotland contributes an average of over 10,000 in tax revenue. By 2040, lower migration alone would reduce our GDP by 4.5%, equivalent to a fall of almost 5 billion. In terms of our population, the number of deaths expected in the years to 2040 will vastly outnumber the number of births. So action is required to maintain and grow Scotland's working age population to help support and the welcome fact that people are living longer. It's clear that the UK government's plans to reduce migration, their plans to reduce migration, would not support Scotland's economy or our population needs. That is factual analysis. Remember, all of Scotland's population growth over the next 25 years is projected to come from migration. We are reliant on it. Therefore, for the sake of Scotland's economic security and considering Scotland's population projections, there's an overwhelming case for Scotland to have the power to tailor migration policy differently. Now, it's been insinuated that Scotland isn't a, a place that's attractive. It is. Edinburgh was rated second in the world for quality of life. The problem, one of the main barriers, is current immigration law and policy, and Brexit is going to make it worse. The Scottish Government's proposals to give our Parliament a greater say on UK migration policy to support our needs are sensible and increasingly necessary. There has been no clarity from the UK Government on what migration policy will be prospective post-Brexit. That is astonishing. So if Westminster doesn't want to provide adequate vision or values when it comes to migration, then it should give this Parliament the powers to do something more effective and ethical to keep our country internationalist and outward looking, secure and competitive and to take you our must country come forward. To close. Colleen McNeill, McNeill, followed by Stuart McMillan. Presiding officer, um, I'm going to begin my contribution by cutting uh, straight to the chase. There anyone who thinks that you can plug the gap by only upskilling the existing population is not looking at the facts. Because every single other person, uh, apart from Graham Simpson, it would seem, perhaps not quite sure what Jamie Green is saying. Um, EU migration has been a positive story for Scotland. But that's not what I come to say today. I know that's the case in terms of cultural enrichment. But it's because of our economic success. And whether you are for or against increased or liberal EU migration, the facts show 
that it is essential that we deal with the issue. Like Gillian Martin, I could recycle another speech just for today, but I have consistently argued that we need a differentiated policy on immigration, not a separate policy. We need a differentiation policy which recognises that the facts on the ground in Scotland are different. They may be different in Newcastle, for all I know, and they may be different in other regions. But if we are one United Kingdom, and I still believe in that, then there has to be a policy which recognises the needs of every part of the UK. 5% of the workforce, as we know, are EU migrants, and they are key to certain sectors. Modelling by the Scottish Government shows that EU immigration enhances our GDP by £34,000, not to mention um, what others have said about the population being younger than the rest of the population. It is a lot to lose if you don't recognise the facts on the ground. 63% of Scots would indeed accept freedom of movement in order to get a trade deal which they think was beneficial for Scotland. But I recognise that that doesn't mean there isn't public concern around immigration. I think it'd be wrong not to acknowledge that. But I think as politicians, it is our job to ensure that people see the positive impact of immigration and the economic needs of our country depend on it. It was the IPPR who said that net migration targets published by the Home Office has forced the government to crudely drive down the overall numbers, often in contradiction to the objectives of other UK departments. And I know that today's figures have been announced as for the first time being under 100,000. But we're in a new context now because a new immigration policy for Britain outside of the European Union needs to be designed to address some of the country's core weaknesses. And those weaknesses are not just here in Scotland, but that's across the UK. But that includes addressing geographical imbalances that exist across the nations and regions. Geographical flexibility is a necessity to address the distinct and differentiated problems that Scotland faces. Like others, I took time out this week to read the analysis, the sector analysis of the impact of Brexit by going to the Donald Dewar room and trying to take in as much of uh, reading the 19-page document as I could. It was all the grass that accompanied it. But the central message for me was pretty clear, and that is whichever deal you look at, there's a bleaker picture for the country which we need to address. On the university sector alone, uh, currently, there are 21,000 students. I'm not reading from the document, by the way, in case you think I stole it. Um, it I had my mobile phone taken off me, so you couldn't do that. Um, particularly concerning is the impact of Brexit on the university sector. Currently, there are 20,000 students from the EU, and a quarter of research staff come from EU countries. Last month, the Common, uh, last month, the common uh, Scottish Affairs Committee were told that Brexit would have a significant impact on Scotland's universities and it will result in a huge drop in EU numbers. Professor Andrea Nolan, convener of University of Scotland, said that Scotland would lose out pretty big time and she recommended there should be a much longer transition period uh, to, to deal with that, but that's perhaps for another day. In my opinion, the harder the Brexit, the tougher it will be on Scotland's economy and Scotland's population. Current migration policy that we, it does not address uh, Scotland's needs and particularly the growth in population. Um, it, it would be wrong to expect Scotland to rely on a system that might only serve London and the South East. And that's just because, it's not just because we're a progressive country we believe in it, it's because I do think there is an economic uh, imperative, including presiding officer. Um, it's, the Tory motion in substance seems okay, but the use of the word any variable migration scheme for Scotland must be developed in close cooperation with the UK government suggests to me that they're not supporting a differentiated position. I like others with Irish Scottish Tories who've played a constructive role in the Brexit negotiations so far. I think you really need to speak loudly to the UK government for a differentiated position for Scotland, and that would serve the country well. Thank you. I have Stuart McMillan, followed by Peter Chapman. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer. Uh, I think it's rather fitting that we actually have the granddaughter of an Italian immigrant sitting in the chair at this particular part of the session. Uh, and, and certainly before, uh, the, before Linda Fabiani took the chair, we had Christine Graham. Uh, Christine Graham also was someone who, uh, someone who wasn't actually born in Scotland. And uh, to Graham Simpson, uh, Graham Simpson, I am one of those yellow nationalists that you tried to demean 
in your contribution earlier on, but I'm, I am a proud nationalist, but also a proud internationalist. And this Scot is some, this English-born Scot is something that I'm very proud of, and certainly when it comes to debate about immigration and also emigration. And to Jamie Green, who's unfortunately left the chamber, uh, Mr. Green was uh, factually incorrect uh, in his contribution earlier on uh, when he spoke about uh, IBM and also the uh, National Semiconductor. He was correct about National Semiconductor and it's no longer there, but it was actually bought over by Texas Instruments. And the last time I looked, they still employed near, just around about 200 people on that particular site, not an empty site that Mr. Green was asserting. And to Willie Rennie, Willie Rennie's contribution earlier on, uh, I actually, I think Mr. Rennie was uh, uh, rather uh, disingenuous. Uh, this parliament and this Scottish government has been attempting to lead the debate on immigration and also emigration, but also on the issue, also on the issue, also on the issue regarding the, the whole issue of Brexit. But uh, Mr. Rennie, uh, unfortunately, it needs to have a UK government who are prepared to listen, also prepared to talk to the Scottish Government when it comes to uh, Brexit matters and also matters about population. Uh, certainly, signing off, sir, this uh, debate um, thus far, I think, uh, it has been, I generally welcome the publication uh, of the Scottish Government's paper, and uh, as we do hurtle uh, ever faster towards this inevitable car crash that actually is Brexit, I think it is time that for wider Scotland to certainly fully engage in this debate about immigration and immigration. And it's clear that, uh, that a differentiated differenti uh, migration policy for Scotland is absolutely crucial. Uh, migration, if considered for the sake solely of this debate, is solely relating to the movement of people for employment purposes, is pertinent to the development of Scotland as an inclusive, fair, prosperous and also innovative nation, as we benefit from having a diverse workforce. And it's therefore essential to our economic prospects and also our demographic sustainability, uh, considering the migration observatory and also the University of Oxford has projected that Scotland's population is to fall in the coming decades, that Scotland continues to attract the level and also nature of migration it needs. Uh, there has to be, a, well, there has been a long history of immigration uh, from and also migration to Scotland, which certainly has shaped our country and its people from overseas who actually come to Scotland to live, work, study, help strengthen our society, and we welcome them. And certainly my constituents of Greenwich and Inverclyde, we've got ex that example of both emigration and migration. Now, the introduction of the Fresh Talent Initiative in 2005 was certainly something that has been commented uh, on so far in this debate, and it's certainly something that was welcomed. Unfortunately, the UK Conservative and Liberal Democrat Coalition Government ended this scheme in 2012 as part of a series of changes to the immigration system intended to actually limit the abuse and, and it's created a hostile environment for illegal migrants. Now, ironically, this marks uh, the year of, this year marks the year of uh, young people, and yet it's ultimately our young people's future that's actually at stake here. Their right to live, work, and study across Europe is at risk of being removed through a process which few of them had any say. And the Scottish Government has repeatedly stated that it wishes to remain in the single market and custom union post-Brexit, and uh, an idea that, that, thankfully, Jeremy Corbyn now seems to be finally warming to after frequent calls to stand up to the Brexiteers from the SNP, and also even his Labour counterparts in Scotland and Wales. And this, uh, unfortunately, has shown the, 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 the terrible situation that Labour have actually approached the Brexit uh, mess thus far. Now, the consensus that we actually saw regarding the Fresh Talent Initiative actually introduced in Scotland also exists today and, and to see it reintroduced as reflected in the Smith Commission but also the cross party work that's taken place uh, since then. Now, Scotland is a progressive outward looking nation and saying also I don't want to lose that. I want Scotland to still be that welcoming nation. I want Scotland to be a country that people want to choose to come to live here and also to, to, to choose to actually go and experience other countries but then hopefully come back and I also think that uh, we need to create as much certainty as possible and also reduce the uncertainty that Brexit is actually creating. And certainly for all Scots, whether it's new Scots, uh, or whether it's new Scots or those who are born here, uh, we need to have that differentiated system. Thank you very much. Peter Chapman, followed by Christina McKelvey. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I refer members to my register of interest in re relation to farming. 
For months, industry leaders and the Scottish Conservative Group have been asking the government to drop its persistent desire of creating a different immigration system for Scotland from that of the rest of the UK. Now, a number of speakers have spoken about food production, so my comments will be mainly about the need for agriculture and food processing workers. Now, many experts and industry figures see the SNP's plans for a differentiated system as unnecessary at best and damaging at worst. We fully realise farming and the food and drink industries are highly reliant on EU workers. Without their skill and hard work, we would not have seen our food and drink industry grow into the multi-billion pound industry it is today. At any time in Scotland, between five and 15,000 non-UK seasonal workers are employed within Scottish agriculture. But it's not just a Scottish problem. The labour needs of a daffodil grower in Devon are exactly the same as a strawberry producer in Angus. And very often... Yep. Fiona Hislop. I deny that there won't be challenges in different sectors in the rest of the UK, but the fundamental difference is between now and 2041, the, the natural change, the difference between births and deaths, the natural change in Scotland will be negative. In England, there will be a natural change will contribute to a 39% growth of their population. That's the basic differences. Does he acknowledge that? Peter yes, Chapman. Well, maybe the SNP needs to look at some of their other, their other policies and see why people don't want to come to this country to work. The labour needs of a daffodil grower in Devon are the same as a strawberry producer in Angus. And very often it will be the same people who do both jobs as they move around the country following the work as the season progresses. Scotland's soft fruit and vegetable sectors rely on seasonal workers from the EU. And then there are those employed full time. 50% of staff in our Scottish red meat processing sector are non-UK. A third of the staff in the dairy sector are non-UK. And over 80% of the vets in our slaughterhouses are from the EU. But the status of these long-term workers is now secure and settled. The Prime Minister made it abundantly clear in her open letter to EU citizens currently living in the UK that the government fully support their rights to stay. Those who have settled here work hard and pay their taxes have made a huge contribution to our economy. They have always been welcome, and they are welcome now. I have met with Michael Gove, the DEFRA, DEFRA Secretary, on several occasions, and I have always impressed on him our need for foreign labour, and he in turn has always expressed an understanding of our needs for labour, and he is working hard to ensure a seasonal agricultural workers scheme is in place for 2018. And Mr Gove's words were, that the need is compelling. Now, Brexit will... <laughs> so there you are, we're working hard on your behalf. Brexit will see us control our borders. Brexit will see us... No, not now. Brexit will see us control our borders, not close them. Instead of working on a separate system for Scotland, driving more wedges between us and the rest of the UK, the SNP government should be working with the UK government ensuring the new system fits the needs of both Scottish and UK agriculture and food processing. In response to the House of Commons Scottish Affairs Select Committee, the NFU of Scotland agreed that simple UK-wide systems for the re recruitment of seasonal workers was the best way forward, whilst also avoiding problems at the border. The Food and Drink Federation Scotland also criticised the extra red tape a separate immigration system would lead to for both attracting workers and allowing them to follow the work around the country. How can Scotland have an open border with the EU if the rest of the UK wants a controlled border without some method of stopping immigrants simply flowing from Scotland into England? The potential damage to our internal single market, which is Scotland's best and most important market, then becomes obvious. By far the biggest market for Scotland's top quality produce is the rest of the UK. 61% of all trade was with the rest of the UK in 2016, worth £45 billion, compared to only 17% or £12.7 billion with the whole, whole of the EU. We want to maintain the same trading opportunities post-Brexit with our EU partners, but our internal market is key. 
Presiding officer, there is no doubt immigration and open borders was a big issue during the Brexit referendum, especially in England and Wales. We understand that Scotland does have a need for continued immigration. But why is it that, as, as my colleague... You must close, please, Mr Chapman. Can I just make a, a very, like, why is five it seconds. that five, only 5.9% 5 of immigra immigrants settle in Scotland when our population share should suggest it should be 8.1? Thank you. The last of the open debate speakers is Christina McKelvey. Thank you very much, presiding officer. And if I've ever heard a speech full of... Um, oh, it's absolutely not even worth um, having a conversation about that last speech, to be honest, because it's just full of total inaccuracy and, and silliness, in my opinion. And it's the reason... It's the reason why I'm incredibly uh, um, concerned about the bickering and the bigotry surrounding the immigration debate, the disturbing images, the disturbing rhetoric, and some of the incredibly dangerous words and actions that we've heard from members of that UK government that he seems to be so proud of, the former the member who just spoke. And if left unchecked, this will completely wipe out the fantastic gains and the positive outcomes that we as a nation have absorbed here from people who have chosen Scotland as their home. The Scottish Government analysis paper, for me, is taking the lead, in my opinion. It's something we can all get behind, well, maybe most of us. And as our population ages, the continued availability of labour from across Europe is essential to meet our economic and social needs and to address the potential skill shortages in all sectors of the labour market. Since the year to mid-2007, Scotland has relied on positive net migration for population growth more than any other constituent part of the UK. And over that period, 88% of the population growth in Scotland came from migration, with only 9% coming from natural change, more births than deaths. In contrast, for the UK as a whole, 53% of the population growth came from net migration, with 45% from natural change. That's the difference between Scotland and the rest of the UK. And all projected population increases for Scotland over the next decade are due to net in-migration. If there were no future EU migration, Scotland's working age population would decline by 3% over the next 25 years, while the number of pensioners would increase by a quarter. That spells disaster for the Scottish economy and our ability to fund and staff quality public services. And just for instance, in this city, the city of Edinburgh, 8% of the population are EU nationals. If 8% of Edinburgh's population disappeared overnight, we would see a huge, huge problem developing. And immigration policy and practice needs to be devolved to the Scottish Parliament. That argument's already been won. The UK model, as it is operated to date, leads to a stalemate and helps no one. We've heard many examples of that. Not to the people who choose Scotland as their home, not to businesses, not to the economy. And what is the point of an international student at university here being forced to leave once she has qualified? The reintroduction of fresh talent and the post-study work, work visa initiative is one way of encouraging well-qualified people to stay for at least a couple of years to get themselves established in the career ladder and hopefully then they'll stay for good. But while Theresa May may let the Scottish Government tinker around the edges of a reserved matter, that's simply not enough. We need to have the power to decide upon a framework that meets our particular needs, of which we've heard a lot of this afternoon from across many great speeches in the Chamber. And in the run-up to the EU referendum, senior figures in the Leave campaign, such as Michael Gove, promised increased powers over immigration would come to Scotland should the UK vote to leave the EU. These pledges, like many others that were made in that campaign, including the ones on sides of buses, have been predictably quickly forgotten. And Ross Greer highlighted a very serious problem, the, the horrifying decisions made by the Home Office. And I urge members to read the Destitution and Asylum Status Report by a committee of this parliament, the Equality and Human Rights Committee, and you will see how horrifying some of those Home Office decisions are. And a first priority has to be to get assurances, not vague suggestions from Theresa May. And there needs to be clear and certain security for EU citizens who move here prior to 2019, March 2019. 
The increase in EU nationals being detained for spurious reasons shames us all, and hunger strikes at Yarrow's Wood Detention Centre today should worry us greatly. That is the impact of Home Office de decisions. And the impact a bit closer for, for home for me. DFDS in my constituency handles the bulk of fish and seafood um, product transport across the EU. They are incredibly worried. So worried they are meeting with Scottish Government ministers next week to discuss it. We need and we want immigrants to be treated fairly in Scotland with the same access to jobs and public services as everybody else living here, whether they're Indigenous or not, because we know that they already contribute more. We want people who want to be part of this wonderful nation, who want to help us all move on in this world, to extend and develop our skills and have friends from across the globe. Presiding officer, I want Scotland to say to these people, you're welcome. Now move to the closing speeches, and we're really pushed for time, so strict five minutes, please, Mr okay, Rennie. Um, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Um, Sue McMillan referred to the fact that the, the chair is of Italian origin, Jackie Bailey from Hong Kong, Jamie Green from Canada, uh, Claire Hockey is Russian, apparently, um, and I can trace my family back to Australia. It seems only Jackson Carlow is a true Scot in this chamber this afternoon. But I want to read you a section from a briefing I received from the Red Cross. The adult refugees have a legal right under UK and international law to be reunited with their children and partner if they are still overseas. But children over 18 cannot join their parents in the UK and the refugee children are not allowed to sponsor their parents to join them in the UK. This is having a huge and dramatic and traumatic effect on families. And what we, I think we need to do today is to send a message to the UK government they need to be much more sympathetic to bringing families together through the immigration system. It would reduce that trauma and it would make for happier families and good people in this country. So I hope that we can send that message. We've, um, it's good to hear Jackson Carlo increasingly uh, a lone voice, um, including in this chamber um, amongst the Conservatives, but is a, a welcome voice nonetheless, and I hope he continues to make the case at a UK level. Um, because I think Christine McKelvey was quite right about the, the images, the dangerous images that were used during the referendum campaign from Nigel Farage and Boris Johnson. And that's why it's, I believe um, immigration is at the heart of the Brexit debate. It's the unspoken tension at the heart of Brexit. If we follow through in the promise that was made to the Brexiteers, to the Leave voters, then we're going to damage the economy. If we don't follow through on that promise to reduce immigration, will protect the economy, but will break the trust with those very voters who back leave. So it's the tension, I believe, at the heart of the Brexit vote. And I think it's the tension we need to expose. And that's why I want that UK-wide debate, because we've got a chance, not just of reversing the damaging trend on immigration in this country, but also the damaging trend towards Brexit as well. So I hope we will speak up in a united way to make that case. And that's why I have to say I'm opposed to what the, the SNP are proposing today. Of course, I support um, schemes like the Fresh Talent Scheme. We did that in government. But what the SNP are proposing today is something of a much bigger scale. It's the principle of a different immigration policy for Scotland. And that's something I, no, not just now, that's something I cannot um, support. Because, I mean, Claire Hockey and Gillian Martin, amongst others, were repeatedly saying that Scotland is particularly unique. We've got special needs. Well, actually, I disagree. I've looked at the figures as well. The demands on the NHS, the demands on the farming sector, the food and drink sector, the university sector, the demographic challenges are there across the United Kingdom. We're an ageing society across the UK. That's what we need to try and tackle, and that's why it's important to reverse the trend on the immigration debate. Because if we do not do that, then we're going to end up with problems, not just in Scotland, but in the rest of the UK as well. And I believe in the integrity of the United Kingdom. I think we need to protect the single market. I think that's incredibly important. And what depresses me is that every single argument in this chamber by the SNP is to reduce the one about the Constitution. And I reject that. I think this is much bigger than the Constitution. This is about immigration. This is about saying, what kind of country are we? And Marie Goujon, I accept, no, not just now, I accept your argument about what you say, but we do not lead the debate by cutting ourselves off from the debate and looking after our own solutions in our own way. We need to engage fully in the UK debate 
and I'm afraid we are not doing that when we reduce it to an issue of um, the Constitution, and that's what I get depressed about. Graeme Day, who's trying to make an intervention, I'm sorry I'm not going to accept because I've got a short amount of time, he makes a very powerful case in support of this because he talked about the English farmer who was talking about shutting up shop and sending his business over to China to grow his soft fruit. He made my case for me. He made the case, which is this is a UK-wide problem. If we're going to grow the food and drink sector, not just in Scotland, but across the UK, we need to deal with the problem across the UK. There has been significant investment. I mean, I've seen it in the farms in North East Fife with the heated polytunnels, which have extended the season and produced a huge amount of economic growth for our country. I've seen it there, and that's replicated right across the country. And that's why I want a UK-wide scheme. Small schemes, like the Fresh Talent Scheme, won't solve our demographics. What we need to do to solve our demographics is to change the mind of Jackson Carlaw's leadership in the UK government. That's the way to change it, and that's what I'm going to do. Well, Thank you. Well now call Neil Finlay. Five minutes, please, Mr Finlay. President officer, we've had many excellent speeches today and contributions, and then we had uh, Peter Chapman and uh, Graham Simpson. Um, I, I do, I, on on Willie Rennie's uh, speech there, I'm, I'm a bit confused, because as a Federalist party, I thought he would have uh, understood that you can have that variation, but uh, maybe he can explain that another day. Um, the demographic problems have been uh, well-documented, uh, Scottish demographic problems, ageing population, fewer younger taxpayers and more. Uh, older pensioners, low population growth and low productivity, all causing economic concern. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the reliance on inward migration to meet uh, the government's population growth targets, I think, requires something like a uh, net uh, 9,000 people a year. And with Brexit approaching, uh, or here, that level may be difficult to maintain without a clear understanding of the system that is going to uh, replace the existing one. Uh, as, these, as the negotiations head for the next phase, those talks must make rapid progress to ensure that our friends, neighbours and colleagues who have come to Scotland and the UK to live and work have their rights secured and protected, just as we must see the rights and security of UK citizens across the EU respected and protected too. Uh, one point. Yes. Stuart McMillan. I thank Neil Finley for taking the intervention. Uh, he's, he's asking there regarding rapid progress, but uh, how confident is he? for any rapid progress, bearing in mind the, the, the delayed tactics and the delayed tactics of the UK government thus far. Neil Finlay. Uh, not confident at all. Um, 1.3 million UK citizens uh, live abroad and they require their rights protected as well. Um, and the, and the, the, the talks need to make rapid progress for workers in a whole range of sectors, for our NHS and social care system that both have major skills shortages as it is. If we combine failings of workforce planning with a further drain on people because of Brexit, then we will have an even greater problem on our hands. Graham Day and others mentioned the uh, agriculture and food sectors, construction industry was mentioned, academia by Pauline McNeill, uh, oil and gas and others uh, too. Um, but we should never reduce the debate on immigration to the commodification of people, seeing them just as an economic unit of production or cog in the wheel of profit generation. These are human beings with families and skills and dreams and ambitions who should be treated by any system with respect and dignity, recognising their rights. And we've a duty to make people feel welcomed and valued. And, and Ross Greer touched on the issues uh, within, as particularly the asylum system, they were right to do so. Uh, and developing any new migration system, it should be those principles of dignity and respect and rights uh, that should guide its development. Uh, and within that new system, we, we could look to other nations as, as to where that flexibility could uh, come in. And Mary Gujong explained how in places like Canada uh, and Spain, um, there is the devolution, there is different priorities, Canada also, uh, and Switzerland too. And, and that is somewhere, those are places that we should be looking to, to look at how we develop the system in the future. Scottish Labour wants to see a fair and well-managed migration system that protects against the exploitation of labour and safeguards human rights. The choice is not between freedom of movement or closed borders. That is simply not the case. And quite frankly, I hope that we've had enough, uh, that we've all had enough of the simplistic rhetoric around immigration. It's a complex issue with many considerations in the development of any new system. 
At the heart of our approach to Brexit are jobs and workers' rights. No race to the bottom, no deregulated sweatshop economy, no pulling up the drawbridge, but a fair and transparent immigration system and administered as simply as possible. But I have to say, and, and I've been surprised at this, that nobody has mentioned that all of this should not come at the cost of other countries. We cannot just speak about immigration pur purely in terms of how it benefits us, because that is not an internationalist perspective. Because what we should be addressing also is our own population, failure to grow our own population here via policies that develop that. Um, there's population decline across Europe. Uh, so what we're actually in now is a competition for people. And we don't want to see us having people come here at the expense of the development of other countries. I don't think that is an internationalist perspective at all. So whilst this debate focuses on migration, I think we should come back to this issue of how we increase our population so that we are no longer comple completely reliant on trying to attract the skills and talent and young people of other nations to address our demographic problems. Maybe that's something the minister might come back to with a future debate about how we address those issues in the whole, because that's a very serious issue. But on this issue, uh, on, uh, in relation to immigration, then we support the government uh, today. Jamie Halker johnson six minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, throughout Scotland's history, there have been many periods of inward migration over the course of us, the centuries. Migration has helped shape modern Scotland, and it's right that we recognise the contributions to our society, our economy and our communities of those who have chosen to make Scotland their home. We've also seen modern Scotland shaped by the movement of people within our own borders, from the country to, from the, country to the towns as we industrialised, from cities to the new towns as we, slums were cleared, or the struggles of depopulation in my region, the Highlands and Islands. The UK is now approaching the end of the first half of our two-year journey of leaving the European Union with the associated implications for immigration. This requires a coherent political response that reflects both the outcome of the referendum in June 2016, as well as the interests of the United Kingdom as a whole and its constituent parts. During the debate on, on migration that I participated back uh, in, in November, we heard that it said that the government benches, Scotland's demographic profile was different from the rest of the UK, something that uh, Claire Hawhey uh, repeated today. This, of course, obscures a wider point that those of us representing rural Scotland know well. Within Scotland, we have many distinct demographic profiles, just as within the rest of the UK. We have seen increasingly that issues are not primarily geographical, unsurprising in an integrated economy, but sectoral. We can identify a need in rural Scotland for seasonal, I'd just like to push on if that's all right, but these needs are just as keenly felt in parts of rural England, as well as Wales and Northern Ireland. Increasingly, geographical distinctions within our economy are issues of scale, not of type. In my own region, we have seen a number of sectors, such as the hospitality and tourism economy, employ high levels of EU and non-EU migrant workers. But the Highlands and Islands are far from unique in that situation. Migration policy will not be crafted in my region, but I have little doubt that people there will judge future policy on the basis of what they see in their own communities. While welcoming the benefits of migration to Scotland, and there is little doubt that we will always welcome the best and the brightest to our shores. It is clear that it has been used for many years as an excuse to avoid considering the needs of our labour market in greater detail. No economy is immune from the skills gap in the short or medium term, but a successful economy can only be sustained if we educate and train people for the employment needs that exist and emerge. For too long, however, it seems that migration has been a sticking plaster to avoid matching some of the most necessary skills to our labour needs. Key public services like the NHS have been reliant on trained nurses and doctors coming to Scotland to plug the, plug the gap created by our own apparent inability to train and retain staff here. And as, as, and as uh, was mentioned, that obviously has an impact on the countries that people come from. I'll, I'll let you know in a second. In these circumstances, the Scottish Government looks to other countries and hopes that the relevant skills can be found. But we know the consequences for, for areas outside of the cities and the central belt, as well as seeing the lack of real planning for the future. Alistair Allen. I thank the member for giving way, and uh, I absolutely agree with the point he makes about the importance of filling skills gaps. But will he not concede, however, that even if we had 100% full employment in Scotland, we would still have a need for immigration? Jamie Halker Johnson. Nobody's denying, as I think my colleagues are, are saying to me, 
nobody is denying that there will be immigration to this country, but obviously it would be cold, controlled and it would be based on what we need in this country. I, I heard of a particular example when I was in the Western Isles recently where health and social care has presented a particular problem. Many older people on the islands are Gaelic speakers first, and when they develop dementia or associated conditions, they revert to their first language. Uh, unlike many parts of Scotland, they cannot simply rely on migration to fill that skills gap. And so they've looked instead at their own local population and then adapted their skills policies accordingly. There have been a number of thoughtful and interesting contributions from around the chamber today. Uh, my colleague Jackson Carlos spoke passionately about some of the myths surrounding immigration and its recent and fascinating history in his own constituency. He also addressed the narrow nature of the Scottish Government's analysis and, and referenced some of John Curtis' analysis of public opinion, as well as the burden that higher taxation will place on businesses hoping to recruit from outside Scotland. In an increasing collaborative and domestic, uh, mobile domestic economy, he addressed some of the concerns around enforcement, as well as the principle of creating restrictive second-class citizens within the UK. Claire Baker and Ross Greer spoke about the uh, need to attract people to Scotland, and certainly on that I can agree with them. Uh, and Jamie Green, who we now know is formerly of King's Lynn, uh, also echoed that point and made a number of important issues around economic growth as, attracting key, uh, as key to attracting people to Scotland. He also covered some of the reactions from businesses and other stakeholders to proposals for differentiated immigration structures within the UK, something that the Cabinet Secretary Gillian Martin covered. He also spoke of the potential impact of the UK market and complexities that differentiation could have. Graham Simpson made important points about skills and the role of the Scottish Government in attracting talented people to live and work here. He looked, part he looked particularly at the construction industry in relation to housing, reminding us that there will be a number of sectors uh, and an, eff an effective immigration framework will have to reflect. Willie Reilly, sp Willie Reilly spoke about the needs, obviously, of seasonal workers, and it's worth noting that NFU Scotland suggested they wanted a UK-wide approach to immigration. Peter Chaplin also spoke about the numbers of involved and the significance of non-UK workers in the agricultural sector and his engagement with DEFRA Secretary Michael Gove. He also addressed the key need for a UK-wide solution to the issues presented for Scottish agriculture and the threat of placing additional burdens on business while harming our UK single market. He made clear the need for a focus on either, the, either aspects of Brexit, such as the future of agricultural support from Scottish Government. Presiding officer, members from all sides of this chamber value the contribution of immigration to Scotland. And our interest in attracting skilled and able people to Scotland is best served by a controlled, transparent, efficient system that is points-based and reflects our needs. Not my words, but the words of the Scottish Government's own white paper on independence. There is scope for parties across this parliament to work with the UK Government to seek a positive outcome as we leave the, UK, uh, the EU. Come to a close, please. But first, it will require a constructive approach from all that are involved and an acknowledgement that a unified UK solution is the way forward. Call Alistair Allen to wind up the debate. If you take us to decision time, please, Minister. Presiding officer, I welcome the debate that we've had this afternoon and the contributions from members around the chamber, which with one or two egregious exceptions have been helpful. Um, in November, this chamber discussed the evidence that the Scottish Government has provided to the Migration Advisory Committee and that evidence sets out very clearly, as many members have done today as well, the positive impact of EU citizens and uh, the impact they've made on Scotland's economy and communities uh, and uh, around uh, filling some of the, the gaps that we have in our labour market. Parliament in November agreed that the current migration system needs, however, to change. And I think there was more consensus on that point than uh, we often find uh, in this chamber. Uh, and uh, to quote Jackie Bailey uh, from November, although it was uh, um, remarks that, that were echoed in what she had to say today, um, we should have a differentiated immigration system that can be linked to specific sectors. We have had a differentiated system before with the Fresh Talent Scheme, and we can do so again. So there is a consensus that goes back some way about the need to tailor solutions in this area for Scotland. In 2005, as we heard today, Labour and the Liberal Democrats recognised that Scotland had different needs and therefore that a different uh, migration policy in some areas was the right thing. And that was recognised, I think, by most people as the right thing today too. The Fresh Talent Scheme was both a recognition of the need for a differentiated solution to migration in Scotland and a demonstration that a differential approach is possible within a UK-wide system. And it was certainly interesting that Jackson Carlow, in a very considered contribution today, uh, was um, 
uh, was, was an example of someone who had clearly read our paper uh, and recognised um, that it is possible to achieve these things uh, within the uh, UK uh, immigration system. A number of speakers seem to think that our paper uh, was proposing uh, an entirely new or separate uh, immigration system for Scotland. But Scotland does have different needs. Let me be clear about that because um, there are some in the chamber today who have questioned that point. And yes, of course, there are similarities between the challenges faced by specific sectors in Scotland and across the rest of the UK. I heard uh, uh, strawberries and daffodils being compared uh, at one point this afternoon to try to make that point. But the most glaring difference is around demography. Now, I, I have already made the point that uh, um, even if we had 100% uh, uh, employment in Scotland, not only uh, would we have skills gaps, but that our uh, demography would still represent a problem for us. And uh, I do hope that, the, although there may be differences uh, in uh, the position that I have and the differences that many on the Conservative benches have, that there were enough positive contributions from the Conservative benches today to keep uh, an intelligent and useful conversation going with the Conservatives, um, even if Mr Simpson has to be exempted from that conversation. Yeah. Neil the Minister uh, is the Minister for Europe and he mentioned demography. I don't know if he's been to Georgia, but to encourage population growth in Georgia, the head of the Orthodox Church personally baptises every third child. Now, I don't want to give Nicola Sturgeon any ideas, but um, does it not show that other countries are thinking innovatively about how to grow their own population? Uh, that, <laughs> As the eldest of three children, I don't know how, I don't know how to answer that question. Uh, I, I, will, I will have a conversation with the Orthodox community within Scotland and see if there, there is something that can be done. But uh, that's so far off field, perhaps, I'm not going to answer it. Um, I think uh, a number of speakers today uh, has made comments about Scotland's uh, historic um, situation uh, around uh, um, migration and the fact that we have, for a couple of hundred years, uh, been a country of massive out-migration rather than uh, net immigration. People left Scotland uh, to build futures uh, in other parts of the world. That is changing, and it's uh, had a, a positive impact uh, on our demography. Population projections show um, that in a scenario where, however, there was 50% less EU migration, the working age population in Scotland would decline by just under 1%, and the comparable UK figures would be a 5.3% growth in the working age population. Presiding officer, Scotland does face unique challenges linked to our demography and our rurality. The facts are clear, Scotland's needs are different. The focus of the UK government appears to be on short-term migration. And indeed, uh, there were a number of points in the debate today where I felt um, false oppositions were being set up between action in this place uh, to solve our problems and um, policies that could be sorted uh, at a UK level. Um, for instance, um, there are a number of things to pick up on points that Mr Rennie made about leaving these matters to the UK government. There are, of course, many things the UK government could indeed do now which could help to address our challenges. The UK government could uh, abolish, for instance, the net migration target, change the rules on family migration, uh, abolish the immigration skills charge. There are a whole list of things that they could do and that we would argue that they should, but that is not a reason uh, for us not having uh, a clear uh, position in Scotland on what we would like to do here if we had the opportunity to do it. Current migration policy as set out by the UK government does not recognise Scotland's needs. Scotland depends on inward migration to grow our population, yet the UK policy uh, is to drive down migration to an arbitrary target. A target which almost everyone, apart from the Prime Minister, recognises to be counterproductive and unhelpful. Presiding officer, I also want to say that um, we have a, a long um, history uh, of not only um, providing information on this issue, but uh, I think also examining that uh, uh, information when it's provided. So, for instance, um, today uh, we had some mention of uh, statistics and any decisions on the advice of the Migration Advisory Committee wrestling with the Home Secretary. Um, and these evidence to the Scottish Affairs Committee 
uh, should be uh, taken into account. And indeed, COSLA set out their concerns, noting that we have a long history in responding to the MEC and to date had little success in influencing the shortage occupation list for Scotland and indeed for the rest of the UK. Our discussion paper takes account of some of these concerns and goes further uh, than merely suggesting changes to UK government policy. We also set out how a more regionalised approach could work with the devolution of certain aspects of migration within a UK framework. Developing a tailored migration system for Scotland is deliverable, presiding officer. The question is whether the political will exists to deliver it. I think it's worth uh, put, mentioning also that uh, in this debate there are uh, many, many organisations who have given evidence. For instance, uh, Mr Green mentioned the FSB. The Federation of Small Businesses, uh, in fact, uh, in their evidence to the Scottish uh, Affairs Committee and others, uh, have made clear, to the, I beg your pardon, to the Scottish Affairs Committee in the House of Commons, uh, have made clear that the Scottish Government put forward a very convincing case to show why Scotland's needs are different. And the FSB has called for exploratory discussions between the UK and Scottish governments uh, on the feasibility of devolving aspects of the immigration system. Presiding officer, I can tell uh, that uh, our uh, discussions are coming to a close. But I want to, to end perhaps where I began by saying that this is an issue on which there is more consensus than one or two contributions we'd give credit for. Uh, we do uh, need uh, certain solutions uh, to be uh, taken at a UK level uh, in the immediate future, but we do also need aspects uh, of immigration policy to be tailored to the needs of Scotland and the needs of Scotland's demography. And I hope that all but one or two members today will come away from today's debate having understood that. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on Scotland's population needs and migration policy. The next item of business is consideration of a legislative consent motion. Can I ask Keith Brown to move motion 10568 on the Financial Guidance and Claims Bill? Formally moved. Thank you very much. And we turn now to decision time. There are four questions. The first is that amendment 10571.3 in the name of Jackson Carlaw, which seeks to amend motion 10571 in the name of Fiona Hislop on Scotland's population needs and migration policy be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 10571.3 in the name of Jackson Carlaw is yes, 26, no, 82. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 10571.2 in the name of Willie Rennie, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Fiona Hislop, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 10571.2 in the name of Willie Rennie is yes, four, no, 104. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 10571 in the name of Fiona Hislop on Scotland's population needs and migration policy be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast their votes now.
The result of the vote on motion 10571 in the name of Fiona Hislop is yes, 78, no, 30. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. And the final question is that motion 10568 in the name of Keith Brown on the Financial Guidance and Claims Bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. That concludes decision time and I close this meeting. <laughs>